Hey friends, thank you for joining me on this very fine Friday for another illustration masterclass. Back at it with all of you live on Adobe Live here at Behance and on YouTube and elsewhere. So if you want to join in the chat, ask me some questions, make some comments about what you see going on here today, please head over to behance.net slash Adobe Live or be.net slash Adobe Live or even be.net slash live. We've got you covered with three different URLs, folks. And if you're watching on YouTube, welcome. Nice to see you. I'm not going to be following the chat over there, but you're welcome to make comments there if you wish. Um, just know that I am not actively following that chat. Okay, so Illustration Masterclass, we got to get it started today because we're talking about something very important when it comes to communicating the right mood, the right feeling for the story that you are telling with the art that you are creating, okay? And um, I'm talking, folks, about camera angles, all right? Now, we're not literally using a camera. Our eyes are the camera, our minds are the camera. We are designing an angle, a point of view, a perspective for the art that we want to create, okay? We have a scene we're illustrating, we have a character we're illustrating, whatever it happens to be. There are many different ways to, quote unquote, photograph that scene, that character, or whatever it happens to be. And um, we want to choose the one that best communicates what we want with regards to, as I said earlier, the mood, the feeling, and the information. You've got to capture the right information. Okay, we're going to talk about these things today. We're going to start by looking at some illustrations that I have done over the years and comparing them and discussing what they look like. And we will conclude by drawing some sketches for a uh, final piece of illustration. And we're going to choose the angle that I think works. And we got a fun one for you today. Before we jump right over to Photoshop, quick hello to folks. Diavion, 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 Diavian. I don't know how to pronounce your name, but it's a pretty awesome name. So welcome. Thanks for being here. Cody, the great and powerful. Thanks for being here as well. Cryo, hi. Nice to see you from Ireland again. Christelle, salut, bonjour. Steve, nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. And Sophia and Michael, hello to you. Marie, hello to you as well. Danette, hi. Folks, thank you for being here. Let's go to it now here in Photoshop. You can see one of my better known illustrations. This is my frog on a bicycle from the NPR calendar from a few years ago. And with the reason I wanted to start with this illustration was because I can talk about uh, several of the important topics we want to cover today when it comes to choosing a camera angle and what information to show, not show, etc. And so we're going to look at this one first and right off the bat, I want to point out that there is um, a very, very low point of view here. We have our horizon line set all the way down here. You can see me moving my stylus right now with the cursor. And we're just going to go ahead and create a layer and draw directly over that so you can see, okay, right about where we've set that. All right, so this is a conscious choice to take a very small creature and to make it appear larger by having a low camera angle and give this creature a lot of presence, okay, this character a lot of presence in the illustration, having them rise upwards into the sky. So what you do when you set a low camera angle and point it up towards a character is you do in fact place them, usually if it's an outdoor environment like this, in the sky. And this really gives them a nice um, backdrop, but it does also sort of grow them uh, in size and importance in the illustration. It also sets us down low with all the uh, even tiny creatures down here, the bugs and so on, which is why you often hear people say bugs eye view or ants eye view when they talk about a very low camera angle. Um, I wouldn't say this is quite ants eye view, but we're definitely getting into that territory. Um, now what this does also is it gives me an opportunity to really make this silhouette here, okay, of the frog on the bike, the main meat of the illustration. Now, if I were to take this and switch it up, <clears throat> we're gonna do this right over here to a different angle. So I'll go ahead and get roughly the same sort of size uh, picture here. Imagine if we were to do this, pull back, okay, and have some foliage and some other things up here 
all right? And we're gonna be looking downwards onto the frog and we see sort of the beret here and the little froggy, okay, holding onto the handlebars and riding the little bike like this. All right, here's our little road with some foliage and some plants and whatnot, maybe a tree trunk here and some more branches and all this, all right? So there's our frog riding the bike like this. Now, granted, the frog still be uh, is the focal point of the illustration, okay? It's the only thing we really see as an interesting shape. Everything else is just kind of filler, all right? But all of this business up here, all of this foliage and everything else, right? Covering up that top part of the illustration, of the composition rather, right? And all this other good stuff here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It all serves as a framing device for the same subject, okay, as what we have here. But look how it's diminished in importance, okay? And let's also notice that what we don't get here is we don't get to see the facial expression of the character. It looks very pleasant and very, um, very uh, content today. Everything looks great, having a nice, beautiful ride on the bike with the baguette, okay? Um, we don't get to enjoy the the character's character, if you will, um, from this angle. We can't really see that, all right? We also don't get to enjoy all of this interesting shape, uh, the shape possibilities we have here to design a sort of diagonal movement cutting across, all right, our picture plane, right, as the clouds move in this direction and really give us some nice some nice sort of counterbalancing to some of these other shapes, right? And so that maybe the, the sort of up and down vertical static nature of um, the frog and the bike shape, right? As a sort of element here, right? We really can add some movement there. And we also can, with the tie and the little ribbon coming off the hat, we can add to that as well as the little vest he's wearing, okay? Um, but yeah, so compositionally, uh, this is just telling a much better and more clear picture of who this character is, making them much, much larger in the picture plane than we would do if we were something like this, or if we were even maybe doing something like, like this, if we had just something, look at this, look how boring this would be, right? A little sideways kind of action. Here's the frog on the bike. Okay, just riding along. Okay, maybe we have some trees and things like that, framing the froggy here and there. Okay, and then some little plants and things like that. It's perfectly fine, right? It does the trick, it does the job. But I have to say that as a choice, okay, if I had to pick between this, this, or this, I think this was the way to go. I feel pretty good about that. And now you can sort of see why um, this is what we've done. Now, as far as pulling back, okay, I talked about how much to show. How far away do you want to be from the subject, okay? Um, let's do this. Now, if the illustration were this, okay, just come here and what if this were the illustration? Now, what's the problem with this? Okay, well, we can maybe, maybe figure out there's a bicycle there, okay? But what are we really making the illustration about? Um, well, we're making it about his face. That's kind of it, right? Because that's where I'm gonna go. There's the eye, that's my, gonna be my focal point and everything else. I understand we're outside, we see some plants and uh, some, some trees and whatnot, and some clouds, and we see the kind of what the conditions are for the weather. But um, as far as uh, an illustration goes, I just don't find this to be particularly successful um, because I'm not really getting enough context. And compositionally, this is just dull as, as dishwater, okay? But now, let's take a look at this again. Um, we are giving enough information to allow for several things to happen. One, we are obviously still highlighting, okay, our frog and bicycle as the main subject matter of the illustration. But what we're also doing is allowing for the background to add some real interest, okay, 
to the picture. Some beauty, some beautiful shapes, some interesting um, varying shapes, and some different uh, colors, right? So we have some variety, and variety is the spice of life and the spice of illustration as well. And so by allowing for this tree to come in here and point us up to where we want to go, that's an intentional diagonal there, and allowing these branches to come here and crisscross so that we wrap ourselves back down to where we want to go here, right, etc. Um, we're really getting a much nicer sense of the entire space. But what we're not doing is we're not doing uh, this. We're not doing this, all right? Let's do this here for a second. Froggy on a bicycle. Bing, bing, there we go. There's our froggy sitting on the bicycle, okay? Now, what is this illustration about? You tell me. What are we looking at here? This illustration becomes about nature. It's about the trees, it's about the setting. If you really love drawing plants and flowers and trees and all this other great stuff, well, good for you. Um, that's really then what you want to do. Here's a flower in the foreground. We have more flowers here, more flowers, more flowers, more flowers. Now, any of these options works. There's nothing bad about any of these, okay? It, but it's about you making a decision. What is it you want to show people? What is more important to you in the drawing, okay? Is it all this lovely, lovely foliage? Okay, is it all the trees? Is it the environment? Is this the stuff that matters to you? Okay, is this what you really want to make the illustration about? Or is it more about the character? Right? And like I said, none of these are bad choices. These are just choices that you have to be aware of. And you have to make up your mind and make a decision. And know what happens when you pull back, when you pull close. Okay? There are lots of reasons to make a really, really close up, you know, character study, right? Just on the face. Could be a facial expression that communicates horror or surprise or something like that. And you really want to communicate that clearly, right? If you want to make it all about trees and things, you know, you do this. And so um, this leads me into the next illustration I want to show you, which is this one. I'll move this over here and you'll see where we're going with this. Oops, there you go. Now take a look at this. Let's take a look at this. So here we have some bunnies and I'll, I'll zoom out just a little because I know that um, that little bottom bar I have for the live stream might cut off some of it. Here we have some bunnies going on a picnic, okay? Now unlike the frog, right, they only occupy about 10%, maybe less, maybe 6% of the entire real estate I have for this illustration. So what is this about? Well, it's still about the bunnies, all right? But what am I letting uh, take sort of center stage here? Is it the bunnies or is it all of the interesting and varied brushwork, okay, that allows for me to create these sort of abstract uh, moments all the way throughout the illustration that will suggest the environment in which they find themselves here, this nice park with these flowers and trees and everything else. That's really what this illustration is about. It's about mark making. It's about all kinds of pretty splashes of color, greens and yellows and, you know, um, with just a little tiny storytelling here happening with our mommy and baby bunny having their picnic, all right? So completely different way to approach similar subject matter simply by pulling the camera out, all right? You'll notice here too, we've changed our horizon line, right? But we're not, we're not doing that low, low camera angle. If you were to look at the horizon line here, I'm sure you'd place it maybe somewhere around there, okay? It's probably about where it needs to be. Um, and I'm basing that just on, on angles that I'm seeing here, you know, trying to sort of figure out where would I be to find that horizon line, okay? Might be a little lower than that, but that's, that's the general probably location of it, okay? 
Um, but there you go. So you can see right away how that's a different kind of a feeling, a different sort of um, focal uh, area for us, right? What we really care about, not focal area, but really like what is it that is really taking center stage here and making us admire and appreciate the illustration. It's all of the foliage and all of the marks that make it up. And if I zoom in, you'll see a nice assortment of marks being made there. All kinds of spatter, right? And loosey-goosey brushwork and little lines here and there suggesting some branches and some grass and whatnot. And that's what it's all about. Um, yeah, oh, thanks. Yeah, Peter, yeah, the background trees are obscured behind atmosphere. Yeah, that's a, it does create a sense of depth. Bingo. Um, I'm glad you like the bunnies. Thanks, Cody. Sfumato technique, says RB. Where are you seeing sfumato? Wow. Um, I would, I don't know. I see that or, it, but I would associate that more with sort of that soft, uh, you know, blending that Leonardo did with uh, the Mona Lisa and all that. But if you're seeing some evidence of some sfumato somewhere, then um, gracias and merci. Appreciate it. Golden ratio? There might be a little golden ratio action in there by accident. Who knows? I don't know. Could be. Could be. Um, a good perspective adds a huge value to the illustration, says Christelle. Indeed, indeed. Yes. Sophia says that the, these bikes are strange. Yeah, they're called penny farthings. Um, oh, I see Peter up here has, has already mentioned that. Correct. Correct. I've always wanted to ride on one of those and try them. They just look so weird. <laughs> All right, so there you go. Um, moving on, we are going to take a look at, let's see here, if I can find it. Here it is. This illustration. All right, now, part of the reason for me choosing this camera angle when I drew this one is that I wanted to show really the full body of this man in his uh, lawn chair here. Um, and I wanted it to really occupy this square compositional space, okay, this, this picture area I have um, in a nice diagonal. And if I had, you can imagine, just changed it up so that, I'll just do this as a quick demo. If I had really used any other angle, I would not have been able to get the full body, okay? Um, and what I mean is to really show uh, the body as if it's facing you, pretty much as if he's standing right in front of you, but we see the reclining here, and that's why we have the camera top down and all that. And I really just wanted to reinforce all these diagonals, right? This, this coffee steam going this way, the hair is kind of moving in that direction. And then I wanted to kind of cross over it with these shadows from the tree, kind of moving in the other direction. You know, you can sort of see like an X, kind of a, a thing going on there, X composition, all right? As a shape, if you will. Um, so yeah, but what, I mean, there's really no other choice. You can't really do a, a profile, right? So if I'd done the profile, then you've got this guy, you know, hanging out like this, one leg up, one leg down. Okay, well, that's not, that's not gonna cut it. There's that coffee mug or whatever. All right, that is definitely not gonna, not gonna do the trick, okay? So then what do I do with the rest of it all? I mean, I've got this sort of boring, static situation here. Well, if this were the compositional choice, and I put the dog um, right here, okay, then I'd have to do so much more with all this other stuff. I'd have to get those tree limbs, you know, and, and branches and and leaves, kind of fill it in that space, get some, some stuff going like this to balance that out. Maybe I'd have to have um, some sky, some clouds, I don't know, maybe there's a building back there, maybe there's a fence, maybe there's a wall. Uh, what would I do with this whole area here? Maybe have to have some shadows, okay? Maybe a little vase here with some potted plant, right? A pot, I mean, with some a plant. I don't know, I don't know. 
something has to happen to make all that other stuff frame the subject right there, all right? But my choice here was shape-based, right? So what I mean to say is that if I just do this here, I'll, you know, this, there's just all kinds of stuff here happening um, with the silhouette, right? So I'll just outline this and you'll see what I mean. So there's nothing about this shape that is repetitive or um, symmetrical or anything. I mean, it's a really great shape to place in a square as a silhouette. And that for me was the exciting thing about this approach to the subject matter. That's what I wanted to draw. This is the angle I chose to do it. I have the shape here, or the figure, filling almost right to this edge, to that edge, to this edge, to this edge. We are not allowing a lot of space around this shape, this floating shape, okay? Because this is all we really want you to notice is this nice big abstract shape on a um, in the middle of a square, all right? And it just creates a, a really nice balance because you get this, this is leaning us or rather weighing us down in this direction, okay? But because of the uh, this this pattern, whoops, because of this happening here, right? That's gonna counterbalance that and push us back up this way. So you have this tension back and forth and back and forth and in the middle at this nice strong diagonal from corner to corner and it just works. Um, here, this is fine. This is just a completely different exercise altogether. And so you have to ask yourself, what is it that you wanna do? What's gonna be enjoyable for you? What is the reason behind your choosing um, these angles? If it's not for clearly communicating something, and in this case, it certainly is not. I mean, there's, there's nothing about this that couldn't be done with several other angles, okay? Um, but for me, this is more of a design exercise. So if that's what you want to do, if the design exercise is what excites you, what interests you about um, the illustration you're gonna create, then, you know, this is the kind of thing that makes sense. Um, now, if there were another party involved, another person involved, okay, and there was some kind of interaction between the two, um, then I would have to rethink this. You know, what am I trying to show? Um, are they interacting in a way where I can use camera angles to show that one person uh, is sort of more powerful than the other, right? Or has the upper hand in some way? Not necessarily like a physical thing, but you know, maybe there's an argument or a discussion happening. Um, uh, are they on equal footing? Um, are they having a friendly discussion? Are they, um, you know, uh, at odds? And, and just, you know, where to put that other person who's more important? in the composition? Do they get equal weight and presence? Um, this, of course, complicates things, but all of these things to consider, but this, as it is, is nothing more than a simple design exercise. And the choices I made now, I've, I've just I've, um, described them for you and explained them for you. And you can think about this in your own work. Okay. Now, this one, let me just, uh, Move this here to the center. So now this is much more about explaining something to um, your 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 viewer, okay, the person who is enjoying this little piece of work. Uh, so now the way I did this one, this is obviously, as you can see, very simple shape-based illustration. Right, I'm really trying to cut out a lot of elements that don't. Uh, need to be there to distract us from the very core of what this is about. And I've even used color cues for you to really hammer this home so there's no question. Um, where does this person want to go? That is the question. And in this drawing, what I'm trying to do <laughs> is give you a billion clues. There's no guesswork to be done here. Uh, so this camera angle, first of all, is right at our, it's really right at our eye level, okay? We are at the eye level, we are behind uh, the character, a few steps back, seeing what they see, 
but we are standing kind of in the same kind of space as them, right? We're not hovering above somewhere. We're not down below like for the froggy. We're basically that person, but maybe a few moments before they got to where they are here in the illustration. So that makes it very easy for us to immediately understand our surroundings, understand the depth that's, that's uh, here because of scale. We know this is a building and they are roughly the same size, so clearly this must be further away. We have more evidence of that because of this little pathway that winds its way towards uh, this, this uh, area. Um, and that pathway, as you can see, diminishes in its, its uh, width as it goes away, and so we can assume that as it gets smaller, it's getting farther away, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this path also leads us to the destination and the color cues I mentioned, right? Look at this, it's so obvious. There are only two yellow spots in the entire illustration, okay? This window here, someone or something is in that window. That's where he needs to get. He's wearing the same color uh, cowl there, if you call it that, and um, that's what's that what's the word cowl no, a sort of like combination of a hat and a tiny little cape or whatever um so they they are matching right we're immediately as a viewer going aha that's related to that um or that has some importance okay um but yeah what we're doing is we're giving enough information so that we get a little bit of a scale thing going on Right, we can see the destination. We have enough of the environment around us to get a sort of sense of the time of the year, maybe. They see no leaves on these trees, right? And things feel cold and a little gloomy because of the clouds and because of the greens and the blues. Everything's a little sparse, right? Um, we have this castle just kind of recede into uh, the... Maybe recede's the wrong word, but it just kind of blends in with the, the ground there, so... That's another trick we can use to establish more distance. Um, but this is just the right, uh, the right pullback, the right amount of pullback, all right? This illustration would be no good if it looked like, you know, like this, right? That's not gonna cut it. We gotta pull back, we gotta give ourselves more information. Do we wanna go all the way out here? Probably not, you just have to frame everything so it works. And then, you know, call it a day. So these are the exercises you do. These are, this is what you do with thumbnails. This is how you arrive at the place where you know um, that you're telling everybody enough. You're telling them what you want to tell them, okay? The most important parts. And a lot of the rest is window dressing, okay? That's where you can have fun and play and use textures and use details and things. So long as you know that you're not distracting from the main story, all right, right here. Um, Sophia says, I have no idea where he wants to go. <laughs> there is a cool pub in the tower, says Steve. Yeah, yeah. Um, Peter says, this makes you want to know the story. Yeah, I hope so, hope so. Um, cool. Oh, RB, you're talking about Back Behind the Foliage and the Sun, a Spumato presentation. Oh, yeah, I, I see what you meant about that, the bunny illustration. Thanks. Okay, that makes sense. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so let us look at another example. Oops, here we go. Um, this is similar to Froggy, right? And now you can see another way of using this same angle, but also, okay, we're giving us, we're giving ourselves a little bit, okay, of information about the setting. And um, this camera angle could be, it could have been anything, but the, again, we now understand this is the character we want to pay attention to. This character is the largest. This low camera angle gives us the ability to really make this character stand out. And as before, what do we have in the background? Framing the character, mostly sky. They're as big as the sky, right? But the other good thing you can use with any composition, we talked about this in the composition master classes, is of course, right? Taking your characters and using some directional cues with their eyes. N'est-ce pas? Okay, that's what we want to do. And so here we go. Boom, 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 boom. I say, this is, where is he looking? He's looking this way. Okay. Where are we? Oh, there's a lighthouse. These must be seagulls. We are by the coast. All right. 
You don't need any more information than that. You keep the colors really, really simple. No reason to go in, you know, crazy with the color. We match the red, right? These are the important bits. We match the red to the red. A little bit of red right there just for an accent. And as with so many other illustrations, you've got a nice, what? Triangle, keeping us going where we need to go. Triangle, that is our friend, all right? Um, little device I don't use that often, but in this case I thought it was really fun is to have, you can see, part of the, uh, the character, the illustration, the shapes that you draw just kind of bounce out of what seems to be the frame of the illustration. Even though the frame here is quite loosely drawn, you see it's got some texture and all that. But this also is just a fun device and you can think about using that from time to time. Now as with the other character we just saw, the guy walking towards the, um, the uh, castle, and the light in the tower. Um, we are pulling back enough to tell everything we need to tell you. No more. We're not going back any further than that because we don't want to lose focus and we don't want to get distracted by whatever's happening over here, whatever's happening either here to the extreme foreground or off to here. We have our, our focal points all set and we have our story being told and we are good to go. Alrighty. Now, this one you may remember from another masterclass a couple of years ago on drawing posters. And um, you can see here we're reversing things instead of doing this sort of looking um, down the low camera angle, we're above our character. And this is just like the, the man in the lawn chair. Only here, it really helps us with our design, our overall shape design. This is a great, strong design technique great thing you can can try to use which is you know this kind of thing i interrupt this okay right here so this without the circle right what we're looking at is this okay and so we're breaking up our our larger rectangle here with some nice asymmetrical balance okay but then that circle comes in right here gives us a nice break right there. And it also pushes it because of the overlap into the extreme foreground. We also recognize this shape. We understand the context thanks to the court and the player and the racket and know that this must be very close to us since a tennis ball is certainly not bigger than a person. All right, so nice extreme foreshortening there. Um, and then this other shape comes in here to the rescue to really add some other interesting geometric um, breaking a part of this uh, this rectangular uh, picture plane, okay? And once again, we are using just enough, okay, of a pullback to get our important elements into the picture, and we are not gonna go any farther back than this, although there are lots of ways you can handle this. It could be about the crowd. And so what I like about this is you could completely do the opposite if you wanted. You could do this, you could have player okay in the extreme foreground and they're throwing the ball up and there's a ball right and we're looking at this player with big shoes down here and everything just kind of recedes there's a the racket there's the arm and there's the ball you do this kind of thing and then you come in here and you have all the people in the crowd. Okay. So completely opposite. And there's a net over there or something like that. And the lines of the court. You can do this kind of fisheye thing. And then you could have maybe the sun up here and some birds or whatever. But that could also be a really interesting picture. So you can take it this way. You can completely reverse it. It doesn't matter. Right, but either way, what you're doing is you're making something have some extreme foreshortening, some some much more interesting diagonals, and you're and you're making it a lot better for the viewer. Right, you want to do that. You don't want to do this. You don't want to have a poster of a person throwing up a tennis ball, and here's the crowd. Okay, boring. Winston Salem Open. We don't like that, okay? Play with it, get get punchier, get more exciting, all right? Same here, right? 
What makes this one fun? Why does this work? All right, the camera angle, the camera angle. We have some, uh, some action, right? We wanna create a sense of movement. So here what I've done is I've done this sort of a swirl and then place the character into that swirl, top down angle, extreme foreshortening, um, and this just makes it really, really fun. And much like the guy who's in the chair, we just have an interesting shape here that we can place in this space. And then these other lines, okay, help to sell this idea of movement and action, all right? But this is, more, again, more of a design exercise. Do we have a real setting here, a foreground, middle ground, background? Not at all. This is about shapes, it's about um, the design, all right? We don't care about drawing an actual skate park or a street or some palm trees or whatever, um, or some passersby. No, we just want to focus on her and the board and the action and the design of this whole thing, okay? And about this one. So in this case, what is it that we're doing? Well, again, we can see where we're trying to go. Um, but what we're trying to do here clearly is really make it more dynamic by using perspective, okay? Because this is a lot more interesting than this. Let's just take this same idea and let's do it like Mario video game style. Okay, you got all the platforms. And now here's your character pointing like, I gotta get over there. And here's the little crown. Look at the difference. Same basic idea, character lower, crown higher. Diagonal, yes. But because of the static, boring, perfect um, profile sort of uh, view that we're getting without this dynamic perspective, you really lose all the energy and all the action that you're getting here, right? And uh, once again, we're pulling back enough to tell the story. We know that there are a lot of these platforms, okay, that have to be navigated. Um, and we see the, the uh, object of our uh, quest there waiting for us. And by placing it high up like this and from the, the bottom looking upwards towards it, as you've seen with the characters that get that point of view as well, it adds more importance to them, right? And um, that's a helpful thing, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Yes, Christelle, with the tennis one, the ball is, yeah, that makes sense, the central point. Thank you, I'm glad you like that one. Uh, yes, Peter, I have a lot of styles. I get bored working in one style and I've written an article about it. If you wanna look for it, it's on my accidental, accidental-expert.com where you can see um, my article about style. It's called The Style Problem for Artists. Okay, you can check that out there. Alrighty, gang. Alrighty, already, already. So, I think it's time for us to do a little drawing. Now, I did have a couple of more examples. You know, this one, obviously, just a nice, simple, perfect bird's eye view straight down. And we do that, uh, that very predictable but very effective trick of having our focal point be right where our uh, thirds are. Okay, so you know this from your iPhone cameras, right? You know this trick that this is where we have our object, place it right there, okay? It's as old as the hills, that trick, but it is effective. And this one again is about mark making. This is just about a pattern. It's about a nice pretty pattern of brushwork with a little character in it, simple as that. The only, only one I want to show you is this because we have the same kind of subject from two completely different angles. Here, we see the buildings moving up and away from us, so we're under our figure. And the crazy thing about this is you can you get the same sense of a character being high above you either way you go. Here, we also see because of the way that the buildings drop down um, into, into shadow, right? And we know that these are the tops of buildings. We have, in either case, Similar treatment here as far as, um, uh, well, sorry, similar idea, right? A, a superhero of some kind high above the city, but totally different camera angles, but um, different ways to handle it here with the sky and the buildings moving upwards, right? And then here the buildings moving downwards. 
And so you can go either way with some of these things and you can pick and choose. And a lot of times you can get it right with multiple solutions. It just depends on what you think is more exciting, more uh, interesting compositionally, or if there's a specific thing you need to communicate, then of course that's important as well. Beware of falling guys on water jets. <laughs> oh, that was in the other one, sorry. Um, hi, Pavan. Which is my country? I'm in the United States right now. Um, yes, the rule of thirds, Peter. Exactly, exactly, exactly. All right, so folks, let's do a little drawing. Why don't we? Okay, so I will grab my little inking tool here. There we go. And let's take a look at this idea. And I thought, what about somebody, speaking of pools and things like that, what about someone who's afraid to jump off a diving board? Okay, give ourselves some options here. What do you think would be a good format for something like that? Okay, this person is afraid to jump off a diving board. Okay, if I were to communicate that maybe the height is a thing that is scary to them, being high up, having to jump off something high. If you're looking at these options, okay, we've got a square, We've got a horizontal format and we've got a vertical format. Which would you choose for somebody who, who aren't, want to communicate that this person is afraid of jumping off of something high? See what you say in the chat here. And take a sip of coffee while I wait for your answer. I see Cryo and Sophia, I think, have the guess that I would use. Mm -hmm. Vertical. Yes. And you'd be surprised how few people even ask themselves this question when they're gonna draw something. They think, I'm gonna draw something, and they just open up any old canvas with any ratio, height to width, and they get cracking. But wait a second. This gives us all the advantages we need because we're already doing something with height, aren't we? So let's go ahead and do a little a sketch. Now, do you think top down works or bottom up or perfect uh, side view? I mean, look, if I do this, let's just try something here for a moment, okay? Now, so we do this, here's our diving board, all right, now we got our, our water down here, okay? And here is our person. All scared. Okay, looking down. All right, this this is fine. This kind of works. We get the idea. Okay, but I gotta tell you, this isn't doing it for me. This is not that exciting. Why? What else could I do? What else could I do? Well, let's hide this for a moment. And let's think about the examples we've looked at today and see what else is possible. Okay, how about something like...
How about something like this? Here's our pool here. You got people down here. Okay. That might be a bit better. What do you think? Here's our horizon line all the way out here. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. That's a bit more interesting, but I'm still not thinking this works. Okay. Diver's point of view or from a viewer looking up, says Umicorn. Yes, yes, yes. I think now we're cooking with gas. Let's try that because that's the place that I want to go for this one. Here's what I want to see. We are always going to respond to human faces. Okay, we respond because we know what it feels like when we see another person and how they feel. We see their facial expression, we say, I know what that feels like. Okay, so if I see that, I don't even have to see the water or anything. I know that this is a diving board, right? We have enough context there. We do the, the construction of it and all that stuff. We understand what we're looking at, okay? And where do our eyes go? Our eyes go right there to that face. We see a face, we see an emotion, right? Because of the expression. We say, oh, I know that, I know that feeling, right? And what we can do then is we can reinforce the importance of the character by doing what we did with Froggy and everything else, right? We throw some sky up there. It's like they're in the sky, right? So how high up are they really? The water could be right here. They could only be 10 feet, right? We don't know. But by doing this, okay, we reinforce the feeling we're trying to get of fear, right? Put some birds up there. We just have nothing but our character and some sky, okay? And now what we've got is a really clear idea of what it is we're trying to do here. We're trying to say a human being is scared of something. What are they scared of? Well, we can tell the way they're, they're crouched over and just peering down from a diving board, right? It must be a fear of heights. And so, if we take this, and we enlarge it a little bit. Now this could be our starting point for a good illustration communicating this idea. Okay? Fear of heights. Christelle says, I would have showed horizontal to show in perspective 
how it is high. I think that's similar to the first one we did. Call a coyote to fix the problem, says RV. <laughs> Little Looney Tunes action there. All right, so then, you know, you could really start to Could even do this. I think having the hair come down is a nice touch to add to that feeling of things dropping off the edge, right? And then here you can make a tighter, a tighter sketch. And then send it off to the, to the art director. This is what I'm thinking for this subject. I make sure that my hands have the right number of fingers, you know, I'm not an AI. I'm not an AI image generator, I'm a Kyle image generator. And there you have it. And the rest is you design those cloud shapes to be interesting to look at. Okay, and that's all just part of what you can have fun with, with all those nice organic shapes and so on. Okay, some bits of sky peeking through and so on, okay? So there could be multiple solutions to this, but right off the, the bat, what were we doing? We're thinking about the best ways to tell a very specific story to the um, to the viewer, right? Which is that this person is afraid. Now, if we pull way, way back and show them up at the top of the diving board and you can't see their face, can you communicate that? Meh, probably not. 
I would say not. No, what we did was we picked the angle for the job. And that is what this class was about today. Pick the angle for the job and you have done your work. And there you go, gang. That's it. We did it. What do you think? Thanks for hanging out. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, we'll be back again next week. So until then, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Remember to be kind. And I'll say ciao for now.